Hello, 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 and welcome to the very first episode of the Sober Butterfly Podcast. I'm your host, Nidhi Movina, and before we jump into today's episode, I just wanted to share three things I really want to do with this podcast. The first thing I want to do with this podcast is have honest discussion. Now, so much of my life in the before sober times was spent in lies and secrecy and shame and I don't want to live that way in sobriety. There's a great quote that I love by Brene Brown that I'm just going to read to you quickly. She says, shame loves secrecy. The most dangerous thing to do after a shaming experience is to hide or bury our story. When we bury our story, the shame metastasizes, end quote, almost like a cancer. I want to have real talk about addiction, recovery, trauma, relationships, joy, and pain. The second thing I aim to do with this podcast is to change the way people view sobriety. Now, I've decidedly given up on trying to convince people of the ills of alcohol. Let's just say big alcohol, you have won this round. Instead, I think a better use of my time is showing people through my actions, through my lifestyle, through this podcast how incredibly transformative sobriety is and can be from the inside out. Now, is it the solution to all life's problems? Absolutely not, but it's a great place to start when you're slowly drinking yourself to death. The third and last thing I aim to do with this podcast is to inspire people like my first guest, Faith Grant. Faith is a native Miami sober girl, and I've known Faith for a really long time since college, and I would love for you to hear her story. Stay tuned for today's episode. I hope you enjoy. Faith. And welcome to the Sober Butterfly Podcast. Beautiful, how are you? Hello, Nadine. I'm doing well. Um, It's a nice Saturday-ish morning, so I'm doing good. good. And tell the viewers at home, where are you? Like, where can we find Faith? I am in Miami, Florida, South Miami, to be specific. So awesome. I won't give too much details because I don't want nobody trying to find me. But yes. Right. And if you guys could see how lovely Faith <laughs> is, oh yeah, I, I wouldn't disclose too much about where exactly to locate you. Her coordinates are, no, I'm joking. Um, so I'm so happy to have you, Faith. And as I was like doing research um, in terms of like trying to prepare for today's show, I realized that you and I have known each other. Can you believe it? Drum roll, please. We have known each other for 13 years. Can you believe that? That's insane. It's insane. I, I don't know where the time has gone, <laughs> but I think we'll talk more about that later. But we yeah, shall. That's a long we time. shall. <laughs> it's been a really long time. So, um, for viewers listening at home, Faith and I met um, 13 years ago in college. We both attended the Florida A&M University, which stands for Florida. Whoop whoop. Agricultural and Mechanical University. It's a mouthful. My mom still likes to call it FAMU. <laughs> like, it's not FAMU, it's FAMU. Um, and it's a historically black college located in Tallahassee, Florida. And so I just want to set the scene, if it's okay with you, Faith, because I know a lot of people are like, yeah, college, I get it. Like, toxic drinking culture, everyone's binge drinking. But I like to think that there was something very um, unique. <laughs> about going to FAMU in Tallahassee because there's three schools in this small town. So everything is catered to this college culture, also known as drinking culture. And I don't know about you, Faith, but I took a lot of pride when I was there and like how amazing it was that we were like a party school, party town, and everything was catered for us. And we got away with a lot and we did a lot and definitely pushed boundaries. And I even remember like, So in terms of like drinking culture, like we pre-gamed for everything. And I do mean everything, like um, Relay for Life, which is the cancer walk, I remember. (laughs) I pre-gamed for, um, I pre-gamed for convocation. Maya Angelou came, like, like, and I'm like, you know, um, it was a bragging right. So I was like, yeah, like I go to a school where all we do is sort of like party and obviously there's more to that like I'm not gonna you know do family like that like I learned a lot but I partied a lot too and so I just wanted to like put that out there because I think that what makes family is also special is that because it's in Tallahassee we we had a different sort of like HBCU or historically black college experience because we were across the street from 
Florida State. And so we were right. tailgating too. And Faith and I ran in very like close circles. Yeah. Um, she was actually best friends with my, um, not best friends, sorry, roommates with my best friend um, freshman year. And that's how I met Faith. Faith, I'm just wondering, what was your favorite memory from college? Oh my goodness. First of all, I forgot half of those things. When you mentioned Relay for Life, I was like, oh my goodness, I really did that. I really was drunk at a cancer walk event. Um, mm -hmm. It was, my, I was there. <laughs> my favorite memory, oh my goodness, there's so many at FAM. I honestly believe it was just cultivating so many different types of relationships mm -hmm. and, and what that meant as a young woman growing up, um, also being, like you said, in the middle of a college town. Um, so I personally know and feel that just connecting with people was what was most valuable to me. And that looked like a lot of different things. These different friendships and relationships required a lot from you. And it, it varied. So thinking about like drinking culture, I know that was like a consistent thing. I don't think I had a friend in college that didn't drink. Oof. Now that I actually think about it. I don't know anyone that didn't drink. I'm sure they existed. And I like that you said right. cultivating relationships. And I asked this question about your favorite memory because I can't separate from college, especially, I can't separate my memories from drinking. And so when you said cultivate, cultivating relationships, I also agree, like, I think that was one of the best parts, right? Like we made our best friends. I think it's almost like your net worth is your network. Um, yes. And so we chose to hang around. Like I said, Faith and I ran in the same circle. We right. chose to associate ourselves with people who were just like us, which was people that were partying um, exactly. a lot. Um, for me, it was daily. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like I think culturing relationships is super important. And I think that's a great memory to have. But also realizing that the relationships we cultivated were almost like the foundation was drinking. Was and drinking. I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the relationships at all. Right. But I realized that a lot right. of things like um, some of my best friends I've had the highest of the high moments with but also the lowest and the common denominator was always alcohol, whether it was the highest high because we're having the time of our life tailgating or right. doing whatever crazy thing that we shouldn't be doing or the lowest of the low being like, oh, I forgot alcohol is a depressant and I'm now depressed slash going psychopath in the bathroom destroying things. <laughs> so that's more about me, not about Faith. Um, no, but, that, but just to your point, it, it makes me even now – thinking, just reflecting of all my different relationships and like what was the foundation of them and, and if they are still valuable. I still mm. think about that now and I'm contemplating that now with the relationships I've built. Are they based on me being this fun, outgoing person that people want to be around? Is it based on similar values, backgrounds? Mm. Like it makes me recalibrate <laughs> the way that I've been functioning all these years based That's beautiful. on relationships. Yeah. Have you found that any of your relationships from college, like a lot of my best friends, I don't have that many friends from high school. I went to three different high schools, but all of my like childhood friends mm -hmm. are from FAMU and some of the relationships have lasted. Some of them had, have changed over time. Do you feel that any of your relationships have shifted since obviously entered a new phase of life and it's been, mm -hmm. you know, 13 or 10 plus years or nine years since we graduated? Definitely. I think the closer bonds I've had with people um, have shifted. Um, and I, that can be for many different things with drinking per se. I, I think it has changed the dynamics uh, for, for example, like everyone just wants to go eat and drink, mm -hmm. but it's like there are so many different other activities that we can do. So that mm -hmm. creates conflict or challenges. But I feel as if I had a lot of associates. Um, mm -hmm. I don't get relatively close to a lot of people. Like you mentioned, you have like a few, a handful of people that you're really close to. Mm -hmm. um, so those relationships have lasted. Again, they shift and they look different. But it, it just makes me think like if, are, were they friendships? Were they associations? Mm -hmm. Is it just the culture of FAMU to just know as many people again your network is your net worth um and get your name out there and and be known for all these different things but at the end of the day 
like what are those systems of support that you're mm. actually nurturing and, right. and what does that relationship look like so i'm always going in my head thinking about um did i waste time or like, are these these people were they really my friends um mm. <laughs> and 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 what does friendship mean so right yeah yeah i love that like reevaluating the like not the value or, or the qual yeah like the quality of the relationship and then right. so when you have alcohol and substances in the mix it can be hard especially when you're thinking back like was that authentic or was oh that gosh. contrived or was that just the like you know mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to distinguish sometimes the difference so I, I definitely relate to that and like I said a lot of my relationships relationships have had to shift for the yeah. good, for the bad, for the ugly. And, right. you know, I've lost friends because of things that I've done in the past, um, usually under the influence. And mm -hmm. now that I'm sober, I still have to accept that, right? Like, I right. don't, I can't go back in time. I can only learn the lesson from where I'm sitting now today. I'm wondering, Faith, if you could go back to, oh, should I tell them how old we are? Should, if yeah. you could go back to 2009. <laughs> we look great. <nine. laughs> 2009, yeah, 2000, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> And talk to 18 year old Faith, you know, what advice, what piece of advice would you give yourself, younger Faith in 2009, you know, you're embarking on a new journey away from home in college. What do you tell her? That's such a good question. Oh, man. Um, I've always been, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I've always been someone that like thought and thinks outside of the box. I've mm -hmm. always been in my own lane. Um, and I believe once you're immersed into this different type of culture, Tallahassee is night and day from Miami. Um, and then just FAMU as a whole institution and culture in itself, I really wanted to find belonging, which I think that's what we all crave in, in regards to community and, and, and being alike and having um, a like values and morals so I wanted to find some type of belonging there and mm -hmm. with people that I may not have agreed with or or thought the same so I would tell my 18 year old self to just continue walking in the path that's in front of you um, mm -hmm. not to detour just to get to somewhere quicker or to build a relationship with someone quicker that might lead you to another path just walk your path and attract the people that you're supposed to attract mm. um, and just stay steadfast. I think that would be one of many things I would tell myself. That's beautiful. I mean, do you have any regrets in terms of the path that you carved when you were at FAMU? In retrospect, like, would you change anything? Not at all. Yeah. I truly believe <laughs> everything that happens should have happened and it made me the person that I am today. So I'm thankful for the good, the bad, the ugly, the stupid. <laughs> it all brought value to the person I am today. That's beautiful. What is one lesson that you've learned from college that has stuck with you today? So many gems. Valuable lesson that college taught me. It might sound cliche, but it really is understanding your roots and remembering who you are Ooh. because there's so many different influences around you constantly um what you should be within your career or what makes more sense with your family or other influences or the people around you that are positively and negatively influencing you just really again just staying on that path and being mm -hmm. true to who you are whilst you are being influenced and growing just understanding that you can still choose you still have the ability to really dive in deep to who you are, understand other people, but still walk that straight path. And I, I love think, that. I think that's, that's the lesson or something that I will always remember at college. I was everywhere doing everything. Like I was, I was doing like four internships Ooh. while working um, part-time, while having all these classes, while doing all these different um, on-campus activities. It was hectic and maintaining a social life. So mm. I feel like I was doing so much, but I don't know how much that was really feeding into me. Mm. I wanted to have the college experience. I mm -hmm. really wanted to get to know people and I really wanted to do different activities and things like that. But I also had an obligation to myself and I still do and always will to like be embedded in the community and do community work and, and find ways to give back 
So I was doing that while trying to maintain grades, while trying to be social, and then while also working part time. So I felt like I was stretched thin, but everything had its purpose. I definitely could have done things differently, but in no way, shape or form did I feel like I was pleasing people. I think okay. I was trying to please who I was then by doing so much. Faith today would have definitely said no to a, a lot of different things. Just to, again, stay true to myself and stay sane. I think with drinking, it helped. <laughs> it helped mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't have to think about the stress so much. I didn't have to think about certain deadlines. I would just drink and just make it happen. Um, yes. Whether I was drunk making it happen, I just had to make it happen. Um, but now, of course, I know that not healthy and just not effective. So, absolutely. So, what type of like student were you in college? And I'll before you, I'll let you think, and I'll share what kind of student I was. Okay. I was a naturally. <laughs> um, so I majored in English because I love to read. I love to write. It came easy to me. So once I fulfilled after sophomore year all of my prereqs college was a breeze for me like I could write an essay procrastinate until the last second the night before like a 5,000 word essay and be and do well so academics weren't my focus it was not my priority because I'm I wasn't really like stretching myself I was just there for a good time so the type of student I was was definitely the type of student that was just looking to do the bare minimum and for me the bare minimum was actually decent like people were surprised and they'd be like oh Nadine like cum laude oh, really <laughs> like, they were surprised <laughs> but I'm like because my whole thing was just like I wanted to have a good time and that was yeah. always going to take precedence over anything else I was a student senator and I was involved in this and that but like I always had an agenda like I wasn't mm. doing it like you were talking about service that's amazing mm. I was doing it because it would look good on my resume I had at the time I had goals of pledging for a mm -hmm. sorority. So it was like all of the things like, what can you Dean do? Check, check, check. These are the things like, like a robot. Um, but really my, my true passion was partying. So what type of student was faith in terms of your motivation to get up every day? Drinking patterns, like what type of drinker were you? Cause I was a daily drinker. Um, shout out to you because that requires a lot of strategy. So and that's <laughs> one of my favorite words. <laughs> I'm, a, I, I'm a planner. <laughs> Definitely strategic. Um, so I originally started, like decided to go to college because I wanted to work for the FBI. And then I quickly found I out. I remember that. Yes. I, that. I do. <laughs> found out that I Were you criminal justice? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. I did remember that. Okay, cool. Okay. So at that time, what year was this? It was my sophomore year. I, the FBI recruiters were coming and I found out that I couldn't apply for the FBI because I had partaken in something that was illegal at that time. And it like killed my dreams. And it was like, you had to be 10 years clean. And I'm like, well, Woo. And that hair goes. test. Everything. But hair, Everything. Follicle, but hair follicle. <laughs> it was gone. I was like, what the heck am I doing now? Um, but I, I still knew there was something I could do. Uh, but as far as like me being a student, it wasn't difficult. Like college for me just wasn't difficult whatsoever. Um, I mean, it had it difficulties, but I didn't have to try very hard. A lot of the things that I was learning was interesting, but it, it didn't require too much thought. It was a lot of memoriz memorization. Mm -hmm. So it was a breeze. Um, and so that created time for me to drink and mm -hmm. not care too, too much. Uh, I'm a fast learner um, and I can take in a lot of information. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like the perfect recipe for me to have like happy hour whenever I wanted to, or go out mm -hmm. with my friends two days before a test because I already memorized it or I already remembered what I needed to know. So I wanna say I was a daily drinker, but at a certain point it did become daily. I always had wine. I always mm -hmm. just had it in my room or in the kitchen and it was just always around. And I just think it was just a culture, again, that I can't really say started in college, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, it started before college. Um, in high school, drinking was a big thing. It was mm -hmm. just everyone was doing it. And I know when my dad passed when I was 15, alcohol was a way of how I dealt with it with mm -hmm. other people. And mm -hmm. so that, I think, 
although that's a trauma response and I was an adolescent, I was really young, I think that same type of response presented itself in college, whether I was going through something or not, whether I just wanted to not think about the things around me in my life. I just turned to alcohol and so it became a friendship <laughs> with alcohol when oh, that yeah. I was just, you know, I didn't feel good or I needed to pick me up. I would just take a shot. And, and so it just, it never really affected my studies, but I, um, it definitely affected other areas of my life. Wow, thank you for sharing. I really connect with the part where you mentioned your dad passing at a young age. I'm sorry to hear that. That's never easy. My father passed sophomore year of college, and I think that propelled me into an even bigger drinking problem. So before, I, I was drinking for fun, and then I was drinking to numb. And so that's a big there's a big difference between yes. just doing it for the hell of it. Like, oh, woo, we're having a great time. And then like, no, I need this. Like, I right. don't want to feel. And so that shift really was dangerous. And at the time, I didn't realize it because once again, everyone around me is drinking. So it's it looks normal. I, I can kind of blend in. I'm like, oh, yeah, exactly. like this is just a good time. Um, but in like inside I was you know slowly dying so I really appreciate you sharing the fact that you know when your father passed it was already sort of like an instinctual friend that you turn to and you call on when you're at a low point and you need some someone to comfort you or something to comfort you um, I very much can relate to that I'm wondering about graduation which by the way I was I was drunk at graduation. I, I That's actually a regret I have. That's a regret I have. I was just talking to Ariel. We have a mutual friend. Um, and I was like, yeah, I regret being so lit at graduation because I can't remember a lot of it. <laughs> Post-graduation, though, how did your drinking patterns shift into adulthood? Oof. So upon leaving FAMU, I can't really say that I drank too often and i think it had a lot to do with the person that i was in a relationship with at the time they didn't drink a lot and so i think wait that sorry me. is it the person that i think it is yeah. Yeah, okay it is. okay <laughs> we had so can i tell the viewers at home yes. <laughs> really quickly i didn't mean to cut you off i forgot about that okay so faith and i dated the well she dated more seriously you were engaged right I was you were engaged, engaged. Yeah. okay she was engaged to this person i dated them my super senior year and then i did an extra semester so i think it was the extra semester and it was like a two-week fling but like and nothing <laughs> nothing crazy went down but it's just funny because i know i forgot about that and like now i know who the person is that you're yes. referring to so anyway and he was the most mature person i've ever yes. dated to this day i was just like whoa he's on the track for marriage wife kids all that and i'm like yeah. i just want to go to spring break and <laughs> have a good time <laughs> like i'm not trying to talk to you about um you know family planning right now anyway yes. continue so you were dating someone <laughs> and so, yes, so drinking was, wasn't like a drinking normal thing wasn't a big thing like it was like wine here or there type conversations stuff like that but it wasn't something like me where I want to go out with my friends. The first thing we're doing is pre-gaming. The first conversation is what bottle are we going to get? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think with him, it positively influenced me to think of other ways to do things. But I was still was drinking, though. Like, just not with him. Basically. Understood. Understood. Um, Does he not? So, he didn't drink at all? Was that the thing? No, no, no. He drank, but it very, very mildly. Oh, okay. Just with, like, food here and there, but nowhere close to what I was A on. normie. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just call no him a normal, a normal drinker. <laughs> yeah, but um, as an adult, I believe that I was still kind of using alcohol the same way. One, it was just like given if I was going out, I was pre gaming at my place. I was drinking wine, I was getting ready. Um, I'm drinking wine before I get into the car to drink and drive. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to the place and still drinking, and it's just constant drink mm -hmm. flowing. Um, but also as a response as well to certain things that would impact me. And it sucks now thinking about that because I just wish, of course, like you wish you would have had different types of tools to grab onto. It was such a good and familiar friend. And so it just continued that path into my adulthood. Um, just recently, you know, deciding to become sober and really getting curious about sobriety. 
because they realized that this friend was no longer being a friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was affecting me in every single aspect of my life. And it was the common denominator. Mm -hmm. And so I finally, you know, took that, I made, took that dive, made that decision to just shift and change my life. But alcohol was a consistent friend throughout my early adulthood life. Definitely. Agreed. I, I still mourn. It's like a loss sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like I mourn that relationship, even as toxic, toxic as I now know it to be. Because I, I see that friend, like I like this idea of alcohol being a friend, but I almost see it as a friend of me. Like, mm -hmm. it's like the person that you think is there for you, but really they're talking shit about you behind your back. Or like cheerleading me on for like the wrong thing. Like, you know, hyping me up when they should be like, hey girl, sit down. <laughs> like, right. not trying to get you to Love do whatever. That. And so, yeah, I, I definitely, to this day, I'm that I've been sober, but I still mourn alcohol. I'm wondering for you, was there like, everyone likes to refer to like a low point was or mm. like a rock bottom was there a liminal point in your life where you were just like okay you woke up and you're like i can't do this anymore like this is this is it this is why i'm gonna look for sobriety or like change my life and not drink anymore definitely um so i was experiencing depression i would say pretty severe depression for about two years and i just remember this was like the end of 2019, entering 2020, which I think for anyone that's trying to deal with sobriety or, or, or become sober, it was just a very difficult period. Oh, yeah. um, 2020, I mean, I just remember waking up in fear all the time with, about the pandemic. I was in a depression for other things, a lot of more just like personal things that I was mm -hmm. going through. And again, just leaning on alcohol, leaning on alcohol. But I think the pandemic just elevated everything. Um, I have a mother that's uh, that was in her late 60s and was terrified. And I was terrified. I was living mm -hmm. by myself. I was by myself the whole 2020 quarantine thing. So I just recall waking up at 11, 10, whatever. Um, of course, I was working, but just drinking, just mm -hmm. downing alcohol because I'm terrified. Even calling mm -hmm. my mom uh, and just drinking with her on the phone, crying mm -hmm. because we're both just terrified of what's happening. And so that completely changed a lot of my work ethic, um, just just cognitive functioning, just thinking straight. Um, my emotions, my behavior became really erratic. I remember I was dating someone at the time and I like lashed out at him. I was drunk. That was the first time I think I did that. And I remember coming back and just crying and crying. There were so many little things that happened. Um, crashing my car into something. Um, oh my gosh, just so many little things and I wasn't paying attention. And you know, kind of like, that's kind of how life works. It's kind of like a wake up, mm -hmm. wake up little reminders here and there. And it just keeps growing and growing until you get to that place where you just know. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I just started to feel completely different. Not just the way that I was thinking and my behaviors and my emotions, but my body was changing as well. And me being really focused on health and fitness, this person that's always working out, but then also struggling with alcohol addiction, it just, it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and my body, it wasn't working to a point where I, I just felt horrible. And I was just in my bed at days, taking time off work, just sleeping because I, I was so hungover or I was just so sick. And so for me, that was the wake up call that I needed. Like, hey, I can actually control this. I can actually do something that can change this right now. And so I made that decision and, and I started exploring ways to be sober. That's powerful. I connect to so much because the pandemic was tough on everyone, right? Like most people felt isolated. My mother is a major hypochondriac. And during that time in the earliest wee hours of the pandemic, so March 2020, April 2020, I went, I left New York and I went to Miami to be with family. And so I'm staying with my mom and she's just like not functioning well. And so like that was leaning a lot on my my mental health 
mm-hmm. at the time. And I also felt conflicted because me, hence the name The Sober Butterfly, I'm a social butterfly. So I was just like really struggling with staying in the house so much so that mm-hmm. it created tension between my mom and I because here she is worried that the world is ending and I'm just like excuse my French fuck it like if I'm gonna die let me die at a party I'm like going (laughs) I'm (laughs) sneaking out going to friend's house I go to our we have a mutual friend named Carmichael going he had rented a house I'm going over there my mom was like (laughs) thinking I don't know what she was thinking but I was just like listen I can't like I cannot be in the house but like obviously like putting her life in danger Mm -hmm. because I want to get fucked up and I want to party and I want to have a good time I mean that's really really selfish especially now I think about this in retrospect because I'm staying you know at her house and here I am like getting into arguments about going out in a pandemic when you're depressed and you're adding a depressive substance it just seems so obvious right like I shouldn't be combining these two (laughs) things it seems like the cure it seems like the remedy right it's Mm -hmm. like I'm depressed I need this I need this and like I literally remember like this um gut like a guttural feeling literally feeling it like oh my god i have to have something to take the edge off and you know that that's scary to because i can still remember that feeling that vis- viscerally feeling that in my body mm. but yeah i i do remember that and so that plus the fitness thing so faith and i like we both have a transformation story like we look good yes. okay <laughs> in, in college um freshman sophomore year we were <laughs> I, we were definitely on the F word, but we were like, we were chunky. Like we were, yeah. we were, we were chunkier. We were bigger. And so we both underwent um, our own fitness journeys. And like, I fully embraced the fitness lifestyle. But I also like, to your point, like, I felt like I was not a fraud because like, you know, I wasn't like putting myself like I'm not like a fitness model, but I was always posting about fitness and health. And here I am every single day, like awkward. I got to have my wine, I got my cocktail. I got to like do whatever. I'm still partying. And I would almost punish myself. I was so determined to a never gain weight again, especially to the extent that I was before. So I was so like motivated to like always work out that I would almost use it to punish myself. So like if I got too drunk the night before, like if I'm partying with everyone, Nadine is getting up the next morning and she's going for a run or she's going to the gym. Like people would be like, how, do, how, how, how are you up? Mm-hmm. I would just kind of like laugh it off and be like, oh, like I just have, you know, higher tolerance or I'm just, you know, basically better than you Um, but no it's like sometimes I would be dying that negative self-talk idea that like I deserve this like you you knew that you shouldn't have gotten so lit last night so now you're gonna pay for it and you're gonna do this and I see you nodding your head that cycle it's abuse it's self-inflicted abuse and I'm so glad that I'm not there anymore because obviously I still work out and I'm still really fit but like not having the added pressure of having to work out hungover because I have to prove something to myself feels like the shackles have been released. I, I feel so much yeah. freer, so much healthier. And you can optimize your fitness more. Your body's not like trying to filter out the alcohol exactly. and work out and do these other things. Exactly. But what you said just resonated with me, that punishment. That was also, again, because of alcohol, I was punishing myself in this way. And it just, in my mind, it all made sense. It's just like, I can have both. But if I really want to optimize my health, if I really want to feel better, I already know this isn't good for me. And so why, why am I punishing myself to get somewhere that I'm obviously not going to get to by using something. So it's just a transformation of mind and thought and process. But also like when you're in your 20s, it's just like, who gives a fuck? I'm going to drink and then I'm going to get up and go to the gym. And and that's what I did as well. And it maintains my body, but inside, there's no way like right we're, we're doing this at a young age but at a certain time and place it's gonna catch up to us 30. so oh my god <laughs> when i turned 30 i was like oh like it's not that easy like you said yeah when i was 20 i could spring up and be like oh yeah i'm just gonna go for a quick yeah, like no. i can't do that anymore and then i end up feeling like crap if i don't work out i feel sick mm-hmm. why didn't you work out today like you're such a piece of garbage yeah. that's what i tell myself even to this day like even sober mm-hmm. and i need to, i need to work on that that's something that i'm definitely going to continue to probably have to work on for the rest of my life because when if you've been bigger and you don't want to go back to that there's part of you that still sees yourself 
in that yes. same way. And so I have a hard time allowing myself to say, it's okay, Nadine, like you don't have to work out today. Like your body also needs rest. Like that's hard for me. I will raise you one. My drinking was so bad and go back to the pandemic, um, living alone at the time. So I left my mom's house basically um, after a month. We were feuding about me going out still. And then um, I get like an Airbnb. And so now I'm able to like have unrestricted, you know, drinking parties of one. Going back to the, this body image, I would rather drink a bottle of wine or two or whatever then sometimes have dinner like i would like i would like oh, yeah. if i was so obsessed with my calorie intake if i go to a restaurant and someone's like oh what are we having for dessert i'm like oh, dessert never um where's the let me look at the wine list that was my everything i would forego food for alcohol any day same same any, I, that was like all of college, yeah. I think. Like once I've lost the weight, I think that was the reasoning in my head. Like, hey, I can have this whole bottle of wine and just not eat. And yeah. I'll just rationalize it. I mean, it made sense to me then. <laughs> it made sense to me then. It made, and this was in college and then throughout my 20s, completely throughout my 20s. Yeah. I knew just what I could eat to where I wouldn't look bloated. I wouldn't have to throw up because my thing is like, I would black out a lot, but I hated vomiting. I hated to feel sick the next day. Like mm -hmm. nausea is not for me. Like you said, I'm a, I'm a strategizer. Mm -hmm. I could strategize exactly <laughs> what to eat that wouldn't make me look bloated. So I could wear my little crop top and not throw up, but also like be completely black out. Remember Top Flight? Remember you go to Top Flight, oh you have Yes. The drinks were so strong in this one bar. And it was the only bar in Tallahassee where you actually had to seriously had to be 21. Like fake, I wouldn't work. So it was like a rite <laughs> of passage. Yes. Um, and so, you know, when we were 21, junior, senior year, it was like a big deal. It was like the grown and sexy vibe. True story. I was banned from Top Flight. Um, no I swear to God, I was banned. I, until this day, I don't know what I did. I did go back like a couple weeks later and they didn't say mm -hmm. anything, but they like I got escorted out. Like they were like, you're never to come back here. I don't know what I did. Anyway, oh but God. like the drinks were so strong at this one bar um, that for me, this is, I'm a planner, right? I could have pregame obviously at my house. Cause like I would never go anywhere without pregaming. Um, and then when you get there, like I would have three drinks, three right. drinks would be like for most people with a normal tolerance, you would be carried out in a stretcher for me. That was just like the perfect amount of I'm so feeling. drunk, but I can still make it to an after move um, mm -hmm. if I someone drives. My hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If someone else drives, if, if I have to drive, I can, I can only have two. I can only take two drinks there. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot how I got back there. But yeah, just totally obsessed with calories, counting them. But Everything. unlimited calories went to alcohol. <laughs> like the, yes. they had an unlimited right. um, budget. Like, yep. We'll start wrapping up, looking at your life today. So you're sober now. How long have you been sober now? So not fully counting. I feel like the counting part gives me anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's just me being 100% honest. Uh, but yeah. I can say it, it's been a while. It's been a while. That's wonderful. I don't yeah. blame you for not wanting to count. Um, counting is fear inducing. It can create anxiety. I'm coming up to my one year um july 5th awesome. so in a few days and thank you so much but it's, it's scary i'm like one year down on the lifetime to go <laughs> like it's like oh my god <laughs> like this has been a long 360 something days like what oh my goodness. you gave your 18 year old self advice mm. then what would 18 year old faith look at 30 something year old faith today mm. and mm. think oh wow <laughs> um 18 year old faith would look at faith today i honestly think just be proud like girl you went through hell mm. went through hell came back went back mm. again um and i think that just like how i felt at 18 going into this new environment and this new place and having fear but also excitement i feel like it's the same place that i am now 
And that's just the beauty of living and having the privilege and the blessing to live is that we're able to recreate our lives and we're able to explore new things. So now I'm just trying, I'm living life like I haven't done anything before. I'm trying to find new hobbies, do all the weird and crazy things that I never thought I could do. Um, and so it's exciting for me. Um, it can be a little lonely, uh, but I'm embracing it. I'm an only child, just like me too, so girl. We, we, we have so much in common. <laughs> I know who we know. You know, we're gonna get it done. We're gonna do what we need to do. And mm -hmm. so I think it's just like embrace it again. Embrace the path in front of you. You might not know where you're going, but just walk that thing, and, and that's what I'm doing. I love that. I love that this, like, this is Faith 2.0 or 3.0. I don't know how many lives you live, girl, but um, it's, I love the idea that it's just like, you know, you've been through hell. You're here today. That's goals right there. So, like, I love that 18 year old Faith would be proud of you. Like, I'm proud of you. I'm, um, my last question for you is, um, and I like to ask all my guests this How are you protecting your sobriety? I know you mentioned hobbies. So I'm curious, and I think people at home would be interested to know more about how to protect sobriety. What works for you? So, for me, I really had to um, evaluate responses to things and so i had to really understand what triggered me to mm -hmm. want to drink and so for me it's all about creating like toolboxes so when i'm feeling really under pressure like the other day i was just i felt everything mounting on me i took a nap can't lie <laughs> i took a nap naps for the win <laughs> and i woke up and i just felt so much better sometimes we don't always have the privilege to do that um but I know what have helped me in the past is going on walks, um, anything active, anything outside, um, calling certain people. Like I have a really, really close friend of mine. Uh, I would see like a soul sister and she just finished rehab because she was also dealing with it. So she's also a huge um, resource for me to tap into. But like, like I said, finding new hobbies, finding new things that you like. Like I have a Pilates class in like an hour and a half and I've never done Pilates, <laughs> but I'm excited to try it and see if they're gonna kick my ass or not. Um, so just challenging myself and, and, and just doing things, like I said, I never thought I would do. Like, I think next week I'm gonna be making a rug. <laughs> Wow. So, so, I mean, hey, it's a whole class on how to make a rug, designing it, I cutting it. it, threading it. So, I mean, just finding out and discovering who you are. And I think that's the whole purpose of living. We're supposed to change. We're supposed to evolve. And so I think just giving yourself grace to find out who you are at this stage of your life is really important. If you're not changing, you're dead. Like, you yeah. know, if you, like, there's no point. Like, literally, we have to change and evolve as humans. Exactly. I love that. I love that you're taking a rug class. Like, I've, I've <laughs> never heard of that. I'm like, basket weaving? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Let me know how that goes. I am very I curious will. to know. <laughs> and the Pilates girl, you're going to love Pilates. Are you doing, like, yeah. a reformer class? Is it reformer? Do you know with, like, the machine? I, or is it, like, a mat yes. class? Yes, oh. with the machine. I love I'm Reformer. Excited. Like, okay. I don't know if you've seen Lori Harvey's body recently. She claims yes. it's from Pilates. I, I oh. mean, I'll give it to her. If that's Pilates, girl, let me okay. re-up my membership because <laughs> that her body looks insane. Um, yes. But I, I love everything you shared, that, the toolkit. And I love the toolkit analogy because what goes into your toolkit may not be what goes into my toolkit or someone else's toolkit. But it's all about trial and error. I love that, like, if you weren't feeling you took a nap. Mm -hmm. Do what works for you in that moment. I don't think there's a prescribed method to maintaining or protecting your sobriety, but I love everything that you just shared. And I really thank just you. want to thank you. I'm so inspired by your story, Faith. Um, Thanks, Faith. Just to circle it back to the hill or back to FAMU, <laughs> the first time I met you, I just remember you radiated such authenticity and like genuine sweetness. I really am so proud of you faith because i know this journey is not easy and i so appreciate your vulnerability and your truth and in, in this interview so thank you thank you thank you for coming on the sober butterfly podcast is there anything that you want to share last minute any final takeaways before we um, wrap up i appreciate everything that you said to me but i have to give you a dozen roses and flowers of everything any type of flower nadine 
again, we met each other on a hill. We're familiar with how we interacted and, and enjoyed that journey of our lives, but you really inspired me um, to start my sober life and this new experience. I can't thank you. I mean, oh my goodness, I can get emotional. I just, you just being vulnerable and telling your story, continue shining your light because you never know who's on that last thread of life, what someone's going through and just opening an application and seeing your funny um, reels or, or a post or a meme. It, it just really kind of changed the way that um, I was even seeing myself. It really gave me the opportunity to give myself permission to change. So thank you so, so, so much. That is like the best compliment I've ever received. I really appreciate that faith. <laughs> and that's literally why I do this. Like I need to connect with more women like you. And we just have to see ourselves out here doing the work and knowing that we are beautiful and flawed and that's it. Like yep. that's all you can you can give. <laughs> like your best. Okay, I'll actually be in Miami in a couple weeks. So oh. I will hit you up if you're around and maybe we can grab yes. lunch or something. And make or go to Pilates. Or maybe a rug making class. <laughs> no, like <laughs> this sounds amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. I love you so much. Thank you for coming on. Love you too. Bye. Bye.